going to run that way for 2,300 miles, ending up at Istanbul in about three months, hopefully. We're doing this to check the depth of a puddle before we drive, do something like rash, like drive rocks into it. So uh, we're using the Radna as a, a measure. She's enjoying it thoroughly, aren't you Radna? This is, this is the weather we currently have, which is thunder, lightning and hail. Gavin, Aradna, how are you? Oh, great, thanks. Hi. Great, great to be here. Yes, yeah, so it's great. It's nice to hook up again, albeit virtually. Was yeah, it... we're sort of um, spiritual, crazy running adventure twins or something. <laughs> yes. Well, I think the last time I saw you, Chris, it was um, in Wales with a backpack about the size of you um, <laughs> running over the bridge with Gavin. Yeah, the Seven Bridge, yeah. Yes. So I should say how, how we met for our friends at home. So um, I once entered a 24 hour ultra race. First thing I'd ever, first time I'd ever done anything like that. It was what, about five years ago now. And um, I was quite happy to run. I think I ran 76 miles around this it was around a country estate gavin wasn't it yeah in, uh, bathurst estate in um uh, near um Sarancester. yeah yes and i got to about two in the morning and i thought right sod this i'm going to go to my tent and sleep and when i woke up in the morning i thought right i'll just do one more lap and i was quite happy i i hadn't set myself a target i thought 70 76 miles was okay and lo and behold, I'm on that last lap in the morning and I was really feeling it. It was hard work by that time in the morning. And I'm running with a, a someone who's become a long time friend of mine, Mike. Hello, Mike, if you're watching. And we pulled up alongside Gavin. And Gavin was doing the 100 miler, weren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was my target. It was 100. If I, could, if I could get to 100, I'd be happy. Yes. And then it kind of clicked to me that, oh, these guys that have been running all night long <laughs> are trying to get 100 miles. Right, I see. I, I kind of, like, I was new to this thing. I didn't realise the 100 miles in 24 hours is the holy, holy grail of... Well, um, I, I didn't really know that myself. I just thought it's a nice round figure. And um, I did the calculations of roughly how, thought I, how fast I thought I'd be running how much time there was, and also that I wasn't planning to sleep. So um, I just started downing these um, caffeine, caffeine gels, which 
I thought you could take every 20 minutes, like the normal gels. And I didn't realize till I'd had 12 of them and looked at the packet that it said no more than something like one every 12 hours. So I had, I had something like a 12, a 10 time concentration of, of caffeine keeping me going. And I tell you, it really, at no point did I feel like sleeping. Yes, that stuff's great. If it keeps you awake, it's when caffeine gives you the jitters that it's just horrible, isn't yeah. it? I think I was definitely in an altered state by the time I finished. Um, but I was, I was very happy as well. And I, I stopped two hours before the... I could have run for another two hours. I did something really stupid. I, um, I wasn't looking at the leaderboard because, like yourself, I'd never done anything like this before. And I, I, I had no idea that I could conceivably have a chance of winning anything or, or getting a, you know, a decent score out of this. So I, I stopped looking at, you know what other people were doing. And I didn't realize that there were only like three people or two people who'd run as far as I had, or maybe even possibly a bit more. And if I'd just done one more loop, I had two hours. If I just hobbled around one more time, I would have been joint third and got a medal. But hey, <laughs> yes. I, had a, I had a good time anyway. <laughs> so I remember pulling alongside you and we were chatting away and you said, oh, I'm actually training to run the length of the UK. Yeah. And I replied, oh, I'm thinking of doing, or I'm planning on, I never really think about doing things. I normally plan to do them. They just, that time, that plan can take time to come to fruition in my life. But I normally eventually do the things I want to do. And, and so, um, and then you announced you were going to film the whole thing, which just, I thought, oh my God, that's going to be mm. a, an admin night or a logistical nightmare and um well, it still is <laughs> that film will be finished i yeah. mean like yourself i do eventually finish the things you send me to do but um i think next year should be the year that that, that comes out mm -hmm. but yeah it was a hell of an experience so i'm going to fast forward a bit here because yeah. i feel rude to aradna leaving you in the out of this uh this running tr trio tr d trio duo <laughs> but I am definitely not a runner. <laughs> I well, ran for the bus once. So, yeah, we'll come on to that because I think a lot of people's idea of running is that thing like when you're a kid and you get all out of breath and it's horrible and you just don't ever want to do it again. And it's like I try and explain to people that's not running. I don't know what that is, but that's not running. Running is a beautiful meditative experience for me anyway, experience and, and it, I, it's just enhanced my life so much. Um, mm. but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, talk, talk more about our reasons behind running in a bit, but fast forward to when you ran from John O'Groats to Land's End, mm. um, which was the subject of your first book, which I don't have. <laughs> which I have here. Being, being a good self-promoting author. No, no, no. You should, you should do that because these books are hard to write. They take yeah. it, they take a year to write. That's a year full time that you have to yeah. find alongside your job if you if you need to pay the bills. It's it's good to promote and um, I yeah. Then you, then you've got to sell the thing. <laughs> then you've got to get it out to the world. And that's a whole other. Well, you've made two sales off me so far, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. you, you're going to be lo loaded. That's about what thirty six p in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we ran a little bit on your joggle. That's the John O'Groats to Land's End to to use uh, runners speak, and um, gosh, you were going at quite a fair old pace considering I met you in Devon. So you'd run most of the length of the nation by that stage. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to keep up with you for much longer. I'm I'm a bit of a plodder. Well, unlike you, I was travelling fairly late though. I had to. I did have a backpack, but much smaller, with, with much less mm. kit. Um, and I guess I had sort of, um, I just internalized the process, so it was just a normal form of locomotion at that point. Um, and I think maybe going over mountains and um, so many sort of overland trails and stuff had kind of really helped my muscles to kind of cope with all sorts of terrain. So the flat roads of, um, we were on the borders of, um, where were we? We Dev weren't quite. Devon. We went in Cornwall, but we started in uh, Devon, didn't we? Yeah, 
Yeah. So um, it was fairly flat around there. So it was, yeah, easy to keep up a decent clip. You still found your groove by then. Yeah. Well, hadn't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd had a lot of injuries. I mean, it wasn't easy at all. I mean, but by that point, they'd healed. Uh, I'd had really horrible shin pain because it turned out I had a weird congenital lump on the front of my right shin, which flares up every time I run like over 20 to 23 miles on a regular basis. But obviously I would not, not normally experience that. So it doesn't really affect me in normal running, but um, every day running at roughly a marathon or almost a marathon every day, yeah, that did take its toll. But by the end of the thing, the body just going, you know what? I'm just going to help you. I'm just going to take away the pain and, you know, just power on. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? The, the, the two things I'm going to pick up on there is one, how bloody invincible you become. Mm. When I was a 19 year old Marine, eight, 18, 19, running up a hill like that used to just kill me. I hated it. Mm. I was the worst at it, right? It was, I, it was the, the next worst thing to torture for me, right? On my joggle, I was running up hills in Wales that were 18 kilometers straight up without even stopping i didn't want to stop because i was it was too boring to walk so i just keep running and i was running up hills like that my body had just yeah. you know my body but, and my lungs got used to it but one thing that people don't tell you is that running can be easier than walking because i if you're on your feet if you walk if you're going to walk for 12 hours in a day say you're doing a massive hike that will probably hurt more than if you ran that same distance because mm. you'll be running for less time um your feet are physically on the ground less because in running, obviously you're, you're launching yourself into the air and there are, you know, if you were to measure the actual amount of time that your body supported whilst, whilst your foot is being pressed against tarmac, it's considerably less time. So once you get over that, uh, extra muscular effort and the cardiovascular load, it can be easier to run slowly than walk. Yeah. But, it, you only really experience that benefit over long, really long distances, I think. Well, so this is the, the art of ultra running, isn't it? It's that, I mean, I remember because that race I discussed around the country house was my first. I'm trotting along with a guy. We're going at such a gentle pace. And I knew I was doing the right thing because this guy next to me, he's got all the gear on. He's got the red. Yeah. thing with all the bottles sticking out the nice yeah. training shoes on there you know dressed in all my shitty clothes that i normally wear right old pair of trainers i've had for two years and this guy's got all the gear and he obviously knew what he was doing we got to the first hill and i'm kind of like former marine get into the position i'm ready to charge up this hill and pay the price at the top of it this guy starts walking yeah i'm like Oh, okay. So we, walk, <laughs> we walked up and then it was then that it hit me why ultra runners can run such huge distances. It's the fact that you don't push yourself into that burnout, that kind of burnout phase. Yeah, or you, you, yeah, you, you minimise. There's, there's no... You're very efficient, basically. You sort of say, well, there's no point in running a steep hill when the gain in time will be so minimal when I could just walk at a fast stomp. But you'll notice the ultra runners, they tend to like, they walk fast up the hill and they're only going marginally slower than they would be if they were running. But they conserve so much more energy just for that yeah. brutal bit. In the yeah. military, it's called speed marching. It's exactly yeah. the same exactly the same principle. You run the flat and downhill and you walk the uphills or you, you sort of fast pace the uphills. Yeah. So, um, Oh, and the other thing I was wanted to pick up on there, Gavin, is you when you run the length of the country, you don't half find that most injuries that ordinarily you would have taken two or three weeks off running for, you can just ignore and and, and yeah, you know, yeah, you do get to you get very familiar with the different flavors and varieties of pain, like which pain constitutes. Uh, um, a serious injury like a stress fracture and which kind of pain is just like wear and tear or shin splints or um, a sort of niggle in your knee that you can kind of support with a, 
um, you just bring a support with you and put it over your knee and then you'll be fine. Um, most most pain that you encounter running is is manageable really and, and won't make you won't permanently cripple you. Um, but it, but again, it's sort of like you have an internal sensor that you develop and you sort of figure out which things are really serious. And I mean, I did have times on John Agostolan's end when I had an injury that was so so painful and so unpleasant that I had to take like a half day off or something. Um, I think I took one day off now and again when it got really bad, but pretty much everything healed while I ran. Um, and at one point I was kind of meditating on pain. I was there thinking, okay, so there's three kinds of pain here that are happening. There's like a, a, a gentle throbbing pain, like a jellyfish. There's like a sharp, fiery pain. And there's like a kind of shooting firework pain. <laughs> and I was thinking about all the different kinds of pain and in a weird sort of way, it helped diminish their effect. Because I was kind of just analyzing. <laughs> She's looking at me like a nut. <laughs> no, genuinely, like it's a mindfulness. <laughs> Yeah. Technique. It's natural, yeah. like, well, meditative and and that thing of focusing on something and focusing on what the sensation is that you're mm. feeling, how much you're putting on it and what it, you know, kind of being in the moment rather than worrying about what's going to happen. Yeah, you, you stop trying to fight it, you stop trying to mm. stop it happening because you have no control over that. Uh, but you have control over how you react to it. Uh, I think Murakami's got a good quote in his book where he says, um, um, Pain is unavoidable. Suffering is optional. <laughs> yes. Can I just show off a little bit there? And, and, yeah. I'm, and, and I know you will have been in this same category, Gavin. It's just a friend of mine a little while back said, oh, you want to read this book by, remind me of the chap's name. He's on my shelf. There's it Mir Miri? Murakami. Hiriki Murakami, yeah. Yeah, so this Japanese gentleman that writes very wonderful literature about his running. Mm. And so I ordered his book and I read it and you 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 sense all those parallels that you have with a fellow runner, the way they talk about it. It's all the stuff you think yourself. It's a lovely, lovely book. And then lo and behold, when I mm. released my latest book, there, there you go, mm. everyone, there's a pitch. State of Mind, that's my story of running um, the length of the country. I went on Amazon and um, in the bestseller category under extreme sports or whatever the category is, or, or marathons or something, there's my book next to his. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's um, a nice feeling. I'm not <laughs> suggesting for one minute my book's going <laughs> to sell anywhere near as many as this gentleman's because he's a, a very well well-renowned author but just for that moment in time to have a goal to write your book and then to see it up there with with a, a yeah. guy who's a little bit of a hero to you i'm sure we've all done it i've, I've screenshotted my book and on the amazon bestseller list opposite <laughs> opposite my my uh, favorite runners about writing i run it writers about running rather yes um, and i mean there are there's a very small but growing audience of, of um People who like to read about um, running adventures, so it's not it's not a negligible audience. It's growing all the time. So what I found really interesting, as as a non-runner, <laughs> um, but as an avid reader, um, I when you first gave me downhill from here, I I'll be honest, I remember <laughs> just thinking, oh God, really? Oh oh, it's a book about running, yay! <laughs> And of course, I had to read it. Um, but I, I really loved it because actually, it's you know what what is writing and what is um, storytelling. It's it's for me for the reader. It's um, reading about something new, about a new world, new experiences, and and especially from uh, the point of view of someone who is experiencing it in such an extreme and intense emotional way and that comes out in the writing I've read several um different books which are ostensibly about running but and they are these really lovely human personal stories um and I really love that and I think actually 
you know, when when they're marketed as um, a book that's about running, I think that's sort of a little bit unfair. I think in a big way, and I think Chris, this counts definitely for your books, and I'm very much Gavin with both of yours. That they're, they're very much memoir. They're so personal, and um, and I read. I remember um, reading. I think one of the first ones I read, other than yours, was uh, Dean Carnathers, um What's it called? The Greek one. Oh, uh, Road to Sparta. Road, yeah, yeah, Road to Sparta. And um, we got that because we were at the book launch, which was just after your book launch. So actually, talking, Chris, about you know your favourite moments of seeing your book next to your heroes. I think probably one of Gavin's all-time favourite photos is the photo of Gavin stood next to Dean, who is absolutely one of his heroes and they're holding copies of each other's books and they signed each other yeah, so yeah. cute yeah yeah he, he, he <laughs> asked me this actually brings us nicely on to uh, running the orient but he brought he um asked me to sign my book for him mm. which is the reason i was queuing up um, for him to sign his book but uh, yeah very nice chap very if you ever get a chance to meet dean carazes he's such yeah. an inspiring well, guy he, um i'm sure i speak for many many people he got me into the sport mm. My Did mate, you read that ultra marathon man? Yeah, um, it's literally yeah. all my running books. I think are yeah. up up there. Yeah, there they are, all on the shelf together. Um, my but friend. That thing about being being a non-runner reading these books, um, it was really interesting. So obviously yours, Gavin, was a personal connection. But it, the reason I mentioned Dean was when we were sat in that book lodge, the room was absolutely packed and. I think, I suspect, every single person there was an avid runner and all the conversations were, you know, these things about PBs and what crazy run you're <laughs> going to do next. And I'm sat there kind of like, um, um, and I, I was just really fascinated about the book and about the process of writing. And I still am. That wasn't diminished. I think it's an amazing thing and, and not to be taken lightly. It's not just, you know, it's an amazing thing that you guys do you know with these incredible runs and the, the commitment and passion you have it's an entirely different skill to be able to write about it to be able to interrogate your own feelings and stories enough to then be able to document them in a way that kind of reaches me as an as a reader and an audience and that I mean I think that neither of you nor Dean should take that lightly because I think it's an extraordinary talent and I as a non- Runner, I, I really love to read the stories. Oh, yeah. One second, folks. Yeah, we we may have lost you. <laughs> One second. Um, bum 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 bum. One second. Ah, he's back. I'm back. Sorry, it's oh, my. It's um oh bear with me. Yes, now I've gone big, have I? Yeah. You've gone slightly yeah. Yeah, sorry about this. Just bear with me a second, friends at home. This is the joys of podcasting or <laughs> aka buying a two and a half thousand pounds computer which then a week later does this to you so let's have a look this is this is radio versus video why would anyone do pictures then <laughs> right oh that's better i'm going to do that and what what it's going to do in a minute it's going to flick back again but there's nothing we can really do about that. So, yes, Dean Carnass is a friend of mine. Said, Chris, have you checked this guy out? And he sent me a link to his Facebook. I literally am one of these people. I will immediately buy that person's book then if I see something that I think is interesting. So I bought his book and I was just gobsmacked. I, I didn't, I, I'm of that era when we were taught running a marathon is probably going to kill you. <laughs> and yeah. and yeah. that is the maximum limit of human endurance. And of course, you know, you learn a lot about life here, don't you? And a lot about um, 
psychology and sociology, uh, the, the limits that are put on us. Here's a guy, he's just run a marathon before breakfast for fun, and now yeah. he's now he's taking the kids to school, right? Yeah. Uh, I thought, right, I need th that. That's that's when the so seed was sown that I I want a bit of this, you know. I want to check this out. So I just want to before we come on to the Orient, who um, I want to just cover when you came to support me in Wales, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. So very kindly as i'm running towards the seven bridge my my geography is not very good because i was just looking at the compass and going yeah, south yeah. Yeah, you didn't have a, even have a map did you no i didn't have a map i i, I don't want i want think i want people to see that these things aren't the complicated uh, yeah. plan for months and months and because you start doing that 80 percent of people are going to talk themselves out of it because it seems impossible mm. where in actual fact all you need is a pair of trainers if you've got a pair of running shorts, it's probably a bit better. And you've got to point south, you know. If you've got your bank card and a phone, that is... Well, the, yeah, you, within the United Kingdom, absolutely. Because we're know. a temperate climate where everyone speaks the same language, well, roughly. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there aren't any megafauna that's going to eat you. <laughs> so, uh, actually, yeah, you're right. There's not... Technically, you don't need a huge, you probably don't need a huge amount to um, to do it. Um, I made it more complicated because I decided to film it. As you say, it was, yeah, that that the challenges of just having all that gear, having to charge all this equipment, upload all this footage every night, meant that we had to stay in B and Bs and hotels, which meant that we had to get to specific places, which meant that we had to book things. Anyway, that became a whole logistical nightmare. So mm. I actually wish in a way I'd done it the way you did it. <laughs> Maybe if I ever do it again in reverse or something, I'll I'll try the I'll try the the well, lightweight supported route. There's a lot to be said about that, isn't there? Because when I go out with my son, and here's a lesson for all of us, he's like, Daddy, you're not gonna turn the camera on, are you, right? <laughs> so let me just clarify people oh, my son never goes on the internet. I'm I don't believe in putting children on the internet. There is one clip of him when we ran to Land's End together, but that was that was put out on the nine o'clock news, so I had no no, no choice in, in in that. And it's quite a memorable clip running the the last hundred meters to Land's End with my little boy. I I, I treasure. I got a summer one, but with my mum. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, when we go out in the nature and we go and build a shelter or whatever, he's like, Dad, you're not going to take the camera, are you? <laughs> so. You know, they pick up on these things and, and it mm. it does take away from the serendipity of life. You know, how many people, yeah, well, how many people, I was going to say, how many people, <laughs> how many people have been in a national park yeah. and there's a lion and by the time they got their camera out and they got the, you know, the right setup and they, oh, lion's gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Yeah, you've got to be you've got to be in the moment, and um, so. But my solution to that when I was filming was to talk to the camera like it was a friend. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something I would recommend if anyone does want to film it. Don't don't buy massive amounts of gear and don't don't do what I did and get someone to shoot you from the side of the roadside and get drones and stuff. Just you can get like a GoPro on a gimbal. You can wear it in a little holster around your neck. Take it out, don't talk to it like it's a buddy. Put it back in again. That's it. Mm. And I have to sometimes film the scenery, but I and I didn't have to stop. I didn't have to load. I mean, occasionally I had to change batteries or cards, but that took about 30 seconds each time. So actually, that side of things, if I just kept it to that, that would have been uh, quite manageable. But um, yeah, you want you want to have that balance of being in the moment. And I found I didn't hardly listen to music at all, um, which surprised me because I love when I'm in training. I listen to music all the time, but I really wanted to be wherever I was and to hear the sound of the birds and the wind and whatever else was going on. And I couldn't do that if I had some music in my ears. So I only ever used music if I was really struggling as a kind of motivating thing to get the rhythm up or to distract me from the pain. <laughs> but generally, yeah, I didn't need it. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't bored. So there I was in Wales. The Seven Bridge appeared on the horizon. I'd just run up this 18 kilometre <laughs> hill 
I think I'd what I'd done about thirty miles odd already, and lo and behold, you, this kind couple arrived in your was it your camper van all the way from London. Yeah. Gavin insisted on taking my backpack, which was a phew. <laughs> And that's always a curse for the per that that happened three times on the run. Mm -hmm. Two two Marines and yourself, Gavin, insisted on taking a backpack, which was very kind of you guys. <laughs> the trouble is, that then freed me up to run at a, <laughs> a, a, a semi normal pace. And by that time I was quite fit and not yeah. having the backpack on meant I was a bit like a racing snake. <laughs> and you <laughs> poor guys are like Oh, you know, I've got to with this thing on. Yeah. yeah, I'm having to put put you through your paces, but we then ran what, like another seven, eight, maybe even nine miles or something. Um, um, yeah, it was certainly a lot, quite a long time. It was well dark by the time we finished. Um, we were on head torches, I think, by the end. Yes, and you were probably bored out of your mind waiting. Well, no, I wanted to bring a Radner in because Radner very kindly. Yeah arranged she found this pub on the route and said right let's meet there drove the camper van there then bought me dinner and then Aradna arranged my camping spot for the evening as I was about to hit the highway again and find a field you very kindly spoke to the uh, land person you know can't say landlady anymore the land person of the pub and um and the landlady turned around and went yep yeah, pitch it in the beer garden so it was um it was a result it was also a special moment for me because when i worked out my mileage i'd gone from being in deficit for running an ultra marathon a day so i was under the the marathon distance and that was the day that put me back up back into the sort of contention so your, your average went over 26 again yes yeah. yeah, so that was a that was a nice moment um <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's amazing. I, I want to do more running with people um, next time I have a big adventure. I want to try and twist a few more arms into coming with me because it does, you have a day where it's just pleasant and you don't have any, you don't think about the pain. And yeah, you can still get lost and confused and stuff, but you're not alone so much, you know, and you have, you just have someone else there who's, who understands what you're doing and can share it with you. Which yeah. kept you, I noticed it kept you going. You've always sped up when mm. you have someone else. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, well, yeah especially when, when I was on my bike. When but... you're so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you just, like, remember I'm running and I've already run 20 miles. <laughs> can you just slow down? <laughs> I just remember cycling along <laughs> you being like, it's not called walking the Orient. <laughs> yeah, she's shouting at me like a sergeant major from the, from the uh, sideline sometimes. Yeah. It worked. We got there quicker. <laughs> Anyway, yes. Um, so, how did we get onto running the Orient? Yes. So let's let let's let's get onto that. So you've run the length of the United Kingdom, which is you know that's beyond the vast majority of people's um, comprehension. Almost people will say, "God, you're mad" when they hear <laughs> things like that. But you weren't happy to stop there, Gavin. Mean, you then decided you were going to run from London to Istanbul, have I got that right? Yeah, well, I've got to just go through the thought process of what what happened between there and this because I wanted to do another adventure. And I wanted to, I wanted to have something else to write about, um, and I went through all sorts of possibilities, including the um, um, Appalachian Trail, uh, which runs from Georgia up to Maine in America, um, and then I, <laughs> I pitched this to Radna. Said, uh, hey, would you like to come with me on this? It'd be amazing. It's like in the right out of the wilderness of of like America, and it's uh, it's all forest and it's and it's beautiful and it's really remote and there's like about four roads and there's no towns and uh, yeah, Radnor's giving me a similar expression. <laughs> like, so basically, I'm going to be sitting in a van by the side of a a dirt track in the in the backwoods of America, in the place that Deliverance is set in. You know, <laughs> waiting for someone to come out with a banjo. Uh, yeah, you weren't very keen, I think. I think the banjo was <laughs> in my worries. Yeah. So you, bears so you went, and alligators. You went for a pan Europe instead. Yeah, well, this is this is where Dean Carnazes comes in, oddly enough, because as we said, we went to the, the book launch and I was 
because I got talking to a guy who edits Like the Wind magazine, which is a fantastic magazine. If anyone hasn't read it, if you're into running, it's a great. What's it great, called? Like the Wind. It's like a. It's a beautifully produced kind of artisan uh, monthly magazine about running. It's, it's really stunning. You can. I mean, you should write something for it. Um, they're quite happy to have contributors. Hey, if I write. If I write something for a publication called Like the Wind, my my girlfriend Jenny's going to have a different take on that. <laughs> it's really lovely, actually, because they've got a real focus on really beautifully written pieces. Like some of them are quite poetic, but also illustration and photography as well. Um, so you know, to look at it, it's a real joy. This is something you want to hold and turn yeah. the pages. So sorry about talking to the editor for a long time, and I ended up consequently at the back of the queue. So there's like me and 65 other people waiting to get to Dean. And he's such a lovely guy. He's giving everyone five minutes uh, chat as he signs the books. So Aradna has got like, it must be like an hour or something to think. Um, so like maybe you want to go through your thought processes. Well, yeah, I mean, so I, I spoke about this book launch and I, I don't, I'm not that interested in the technical side of the running, I guess. I, there are lots of people asking what kind of shoes you wear. Um, but I was really inspired by the ethos, kind of like you were just talking about, Chris, in my sister states, you know, why you do it, the different um, ambitions that you have. And we've been talking so much about, you know, what's next. And if I were to support Gavin on another long run. And I was really inspired by, at the time, I think Dean was talking about doing running a marathon in each country in the world each of the UN um, recognized uh, countries and I just thought it just piqued my interest and I thought well that's cool um, and then I thought when Gavin did um, downhill, downhill from here so that was the juggle run um, I think your thought process was I want to do a really big run where's a big run in the UK what about all of it and I thought, I don't want to go to back backhands of America. And also realistically, we're not we're not famous. We don't we're not gonna get loads of sponsorship and money. We're gonna have to pay for this ourselves. Yeah. Um and so it needs to be affordable. And it's you know, I got my producer hat on and how to be sensible. I thought, well, where in Europe is there? Because I would love to travel Europe more and it's affordable and closer. And then I just thought, well, why not all of it? I wonder how big it is. Well, let's get my phone out, do a bit of Google Maps and, and oh, well, where does Europe start? Well, what about this? And then I suddenly just had this brainwave of um, the Orient Express, they train. I've always, I've always, always wanted to travel on that. It's just the idea of journey and adventure and romance. Because when it was first, um, I suppose, founded, you know, when that route started, it was for the elite because they, they were the ones who could afford it, but it was all about travel and experience and adventure. It was going into the, the unknown East um, and doing it, you know, by land and the train and going to the Orient, so to um, Turkey, to Istanbul. And I just thought, well, that's, that's kind of exactly what you're trying to do. It's about adventure. It's about travel. It's about do you know, exploring our world, but, on foot in a different way so I just looked it up and I, I thought well that went from Paris to Istanbul that sounds that sounds like my kind of trip how long is that oh it's kind of roughly the same as the Appalachian Trail maybe even yeah. a little bit less depending on the route um and and I looked up all the stops that the original train went through and it was Paris, Strasbourg, Munich, Vienna, Budapest, Bucharest, Istanbul. And so I'm thinking, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. I would love to go to all those places. Look it up. I'm like, oh, it's only like, it's only about three or 4,000 kilometers. You can, you can do that, right? <laughs> and so yeah. I sort of jumped on. I was sat there holding the coach while, um, while Gavin's in the queue waiting to, to talk to Dean. And um, so I'm sort of like elbowing my way through the crowds, carrying all these coats. And Gavin, Gavin, what do you think about this? <laughs> and, um, and literally, by the time we got to the front of the queue, we thought, yeah, why not? Like you said, that's not fun. Let's do it. Yeah. And 
I thought at first, you can't run the whole of Europe. Europe's a whole continent. You can't, that's going to be vast. And then I looked at the route of the Orient Express and um, it doesn't go from the very, like from Calais, but it does go but from Paris to Istanbul. And Istanbul is um, right on the sort of limit. I mean, Turkey's the furthest east of, that Europe gets. And it's such a historic and incredible core and meeting point of civilizations that they seemed great places to start and finish. And it worked out as about two and a half, 2,300 miles, something like that. So, yeah, just a little over twice what I ran John the Grotz to Land's End. But by then, as I, as I've said it already, I, I, I felt my body was in a rhythm and could run roughly a marathon a day. And it was fine. So what could possibly be different this time, just because it's twice as long? <laughs> very naive. Naivety is a very important um, skill to nurture. I think you're going to have these adventures in a strange way. Yeah, you need a bit of, I don't know if naivety is the right word, but if you don't get involved in these things, they don't happen, do they? And if yeah, I think if we, if, if maybe, we... Maybe you could just say um, boundless optimism is... Uh, yes, I think that's a nice way of, a nice way of putting it. Because yeah, if you were to start enumerating the possible ways in which something can go wrong, yeah, you'll talk, as you say, you'll talk yourself out of it very quickly. Uh, yeah, but, let, let's not forget that most people, sorry, this sounds a bit patronising, but, you know, it's my experience that the vast majority of people don't even get to that step of thinking about it. They've already put themselves in a box and gone, oh, that's, you know, that's not for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, or even, so. even if it's not like a massive adventure, a lot of people talk themselves out of their ambitions or their dreams or their something they'd really like to do for themselves. Like they get caught into the the trap of trying to survive daily life, you know, trying to put food on the table, look after your family, and they don't give themselves the time and opportunity to serve, to have a kind of an outlet. I mean, artists, creative people have that, and they they make that for themselves, and I guess. Um, people go on holiday to exotic places to have a hint of something adventurous, but uh, maybe like life-altering experiences aren't aren't for everyone. I don't know. <laughs> well, I I think a, a big part of it is you you do most people do have to look at the practical mm. side. At the end of the day, we did have to pay for it ourselves. Yeah. We did have to take time off work, but we still had to pay bills I still had a mortgage to pay back at home so when we were first talking about what the trip would be um it was quite hard to get inspired by it because well I certainly was having to have the practical side of uh, you know of having a like a time bound thing that was only going to cost a certain amount etc cetera, etc cetera. um and it was I think the unleashing of it was being inspired by someone else, which is why I think books are really important. It was it was when I was sat in Dean's book launch and I was inspired by him and his story and by what Gavin had done previously. And that's what freed my mind a bit to say, okay, fine, I, we do have to be a little bit practical, but let's not limit ourselves before we've even started to think about it. And that's why I went from thinking about what, big runs in Europe might be to thinking, well, it's still Europe, but what about all of it? And I don't know, I, su I suppose it's understanding that you've got to be able to actually do it. I mean, at the end of the day, you might have kids to feed at home, you might have family to look at you. Like, life doesn't stop. And I, I think that's what's a really interesting thing for us, is you, you're the one who's doing this thing, you've just got to focus on yourself and your run and your own survival of getting one foot in front of the other is the other people who are supporting you um and certainly in our case it was me who was then thinking but how do we do this how do we make sure that everyone's okay back at home how do we make sure the flat's all right how do we make sure that we're not going to run out of money before we get to hungry and what we're going to do because you still need to eat we still need to be yeah. able to buy food so yeah. and we knew that we couldn't possibly afford to stay in hotels or even the cheapest rubbish bed and breakfast we just couldn't do it there was no other way so either we're in a tent which well that could be the next big sport is um 
ultra bushcraft. <laughs> you run a hundred miles, then you have to kill a wild boar <laughs> and make a fire. <laughs> make a fire <laughs> by rubbing two Boy Scouts together. Yes. So, should we look at some photographs? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Let's see if the, our technology works. Yes, that's not too bad. Can I hear you guys? Uh, hopefully. Yes, we can. So, right, I'll go through the photos and um, we we better not take too long because um, if we go too long with a podcast, a lot of people get put off watching it because they won't have, you know, two hours spare in their day. So, yeah. is this... Um, just choose whichever ones you like. Really. Yeah, is this heat or is this mosquitoes? Oh, we haven't got the picture, but... Um, oh, sorry, of course. We, have to, we may have to play a little game where you describe it. And yeah, this is, you, it. this is you with your blue jacket wrapped around your head in a forest. Yeah, that's, that's mosquitoes. That's probably, that's probably Bulgaria, I think, because it, we're, when we're in the Strandja region, which is um, between Bulgaria and Turkey, uh, it's very hilly, very damp. It's like perfect conditions for mosquitoes. And we got there towards the beginning of summer. So I was being bitten alive and it was just hideous. And then we had, had all the, um, like, uh, what's it called again? Spray. From the the spray yeah, all, all, the, all the insect repellent in the world, but it just wasn't doing anything. So eventually I had to, I just wrapped my head in, I just tried to cover, so they wouldn't go into my ears and into my nose and eyes. I tried to just cover as much as I could and, I ended up running with a weird kind of like, almost like a spasmodic, repetitive motion, like wafting them away from my face. It, yeah, yeah, I didn't look cool. <laughs> this is but, one of those unknowns, isn't it? Because one, of, because one of those hats that you put on that's like a net. Yeah, if I could, if I knew about the existence of such things, I would have got myself yeah. one. I had mosquito repellent, and once I got through the Scottish Highlands, it was so cold. Even though I ran at the end of summer, it was still around zero degrees up in the Highlands. Um, and well, Scots, midges, yeah. Scotland, midges. like Norway, is famous for having real killer bloody midges and mosquitoes. <laughs> but yeah. I didn't get, because I didn't get bitten once, that mosquito repellent very quickly went into the bin. <laughs> the, yeah, I don't think, I'm not sure I got bitten really, but um, okay. I don't get bitten, but they just want to climb into every single orifice and hide. Um, and that's not much fun. So. No. Uh, yeah. Right. This one's a Radna. Looks like you're <laughs> cooking something lovely in um, Italian, actually. It's tomatoes, yeah, mushrooms pasta. and pasta. Yeah, I so, I mean, I, I didn't can't remember if we mentioned this. We made our ban because um, we, so yeah, we, we couldn't have afforded to do it um, by staying in hotels and things as Kevin did with the juggle run. And I wasn't keen on spending five months sleeping in a tent. Um, and so we, we bought a van and then, well, an eight seater car and then ripped out all the seats and watch YouTube videos to try and figure out how, how to do DIY. And we built our van in, um, in kind of 2 our specification, which was really good. And I, for me, this is going to be my home for five, six months as we go there and then drive back. Um, and cooking uh, is really important. I mean, of course, it's really important for Gavin to have his, what, five, 6,000 calories. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> every day but I mean to me yeah just I loved that I loved being able to cook proper meals in fact I cooked my mum was sending me recipes and I was cooking things in the van that I'd never even cooked at home just to try and mix things up and you know just on our little stove a little cool box and I had this this my absolute favorite thing in the van which my mum did for me I had a little spice tray so it was this like kids toy box. So um, like a kind of a four by four box. It was about you know that big, and um, and the idea is really colourful. So the idea is that kids can put their little toys in in each of the trays and put them in. 
And so, um, so my mum filled each one with different spices and herbs and, and painstakingly like labelled them all. It felt like when I went to university for the first time. And so, you know, so that had all the mix of like Indian spices as well as everything else. Um, so I could just, I could cook pretty much anything. And it was an absolute joy for me because that's, that's what made me feel like I was actually at home, that I could make nice meals for us and be cozy and that was um yeah and also the um we we, we used an, an old camping stove that could be removed from the van so a lot of when you when you get one of these vans already made they have a built-in kitchen mm. but that doesn't mean you can take out doors ours you can lift up take yeah. outdoors put on a table and cook outside Go and on, as yeah. I got more and more used yeah. to camping, because I, I was totally city girl. I just, you know, had maybe five camping experiences in my life, which is probably why I was so averse to a tent in the first place. But um, I loved it. And by the end, you know, that was, I mean, we have quite different stories, I suppose, about our, our journey. Because we, we were together, but um, Gavin was alone all day long, mm. off on a trail somewhere, and I was all day alone in the van um sorting out everything else um but for me my journey was you know by the time we set off in march so we went through the little beast from the east through sub zero temperatures and all but by the end it was really hot and like just being able to we very never really stopped at campsite you know very rarely um but being able to just park up somewhere really quiet take my cooker out sit there get governor's tea or a beer or whatever and just be able to just sit there outside, cook a nice meal, eat under the stars. That, yeah. yeah, it was glorious. Why, yeah, why, do have, why do we have houses? <laughs> yes, I know. It's lovely being on the road. <laughs> Gavin, what was it like running through this snow then? How was that equipment wise? Did you have enough of the right clothing? Um, I had seven layers on that day, I think. The, the day that um, there's a, I don't know if you've got the picture, but there's like a picture of me running. Basically, it's just a white void. Um, the the photo we're looking at at the moment is one long white road go, yeah, yeah, going yeah. off going off into into hell. <laughs> yeah, that was um, we'd had several days of uh, often on snow and the temperature dropped to about minus five or six or something. Not not terrifyingly cold, but cold enough when you're living in a metal box without heating. Um, and you wake up in the morning and your olive oils turn into jelly. That that's the thing I didn't know was possible, but. Um, yeah, and I just thought, well, I'm running every day, and the whole point of this adventure is to not let anything stop me. So I'm not going to be – there's no form of weather that's going to stop me running, um, although I don't do very well in really horribly mis miserable, icy, diagonal, slanting rain. But snow is fine. I love running in snow. The only problem is you've got to make sure you've got the right footwear on. So I had to, basically, I did the whole thing on two pairs of shoes. So I had trail shoes with extra grip. Um, and I had my normal tra trailers for tarmac, so I wore the trail shoes. I had lit gloves on. I had I had like two pairs of trousers, and I had like seven layers on my top. And, uh, I just you know barreled off into the into the snow, and it had, that was one of my favourite days actually. Just running through this beautifully um, pristine white wilderness with hardly any sound, just like a few birds and the sound of my footsteps crunching through the snow, and nobody around not another human and like I'm the only person making footsteps and, and I sort of ran through this forest for about an hour and a half and then eventually came down back into the town again and the weird thing was it wasn't snowing up it wasn't snowing down in the town it was just raining drizzly and it was like coming out of a little dream but yeah that was that was a great experience we've got a mountain bike on the back of the wagon now is is this something okay. you want to tell us Gavin <laughs> no this is mine yeah. it's a the little hybrid bike. Um, I have to say, so this was, you know, when Gavin was saying earlier, we, we changed it to optimism, but naivety. So I was very naive about what it would look like to to do this trip. And I I had these ideas that while Gavin was off running, I'd be, you know, traipsing around these cute little markets in, um, in Europe and uh, you know I, I, I thought I would be a bit like Emily you know with her cute little bag and, yeah. and all, all purple um, which wasn't 
which wasn't the case. But the bike, I loved having it, and I, I used it a lot, not really to go to a few little markets, but um, I would cycle alongside Gavin if I had a spare day off from chores and things, and if Gavin was somewhere that I could cycle. Um, and it helped Gavin, it kept his pace up. Um, and it was really nice for me to feel like I was exploring as well. So I loved driving the van, like my van and I, we became best friends. She, she was like a human. She was the only person I had to talk to. Yeah, the third character in the story is Roxy, which is the name of um, the, the master, um, the master Bongo. Uh, Bongo, but, um, but it was really lovely kind of just being able to be on the bike and um, mm. cycle along and feel like I got a bit. Yeah, the adventure. you got quite competitive at one point because when we left Bratislava, because we just dipped into Slovakia very briefly, just because why not? So um, uh, crossed over the Danube, went into um, Bratislava, which is a lovely little town. And then there was quite a good uh, uh, sort of cycling trail leaving, crossing back over the Danube and then going in, uh, into um, Hungary. So... Um, I rather thought, well, I could cycle with you today, so um, am I getting this wrong? No, I'm not. Yeah, so it. I think you're going into Bratislava, so oh, yes. we left yeah, Vienna, yeah. so it's probably um, two days of running, so mm. maybe about 50 miles or so, along the Danube and along the Eurovelo 6 cycling route, which is a mm. cycle route that goes all the way across Europe, and we, we only went that way for a little bit. So... Uh, we left Vienna. I spent a really frustrating day in the van doing chores. It was so dull. And so I was like, I'm not driving. I don't care. This is a Eurovelo cycle route. I'm cycling. You can run along with me today <laughs> rather than the other way around. And I meant to just go for a little bit and have that experience and then cycle back, obviously, and get the van and drive ahead. But it was such a beautiful day and I was really enjoying mm. it. And we ended up going, I, I cycled all the, almost all the way to Bratislava and Gavin started getting quite worried. Hey, listen, we've done 30k and <laughs> oh, you're going to have to cycle 30 kilometres back. And I what's guess. the longest you've cycled at this point? Like 10? <laughs> yeah, so Gavin goes to me, can, he, can we cycle 60 kilometres? I was like, nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> And Gavin's at this point thinking we're literally only a few kilometres to Bratislava where we're going to stop for the night. And if Radna drops, yeah. you know, at Bratislava and collapses, he's thinking, I, having run 30, 40 kilometres, am now going to have to cycle back to go and get Roxy because Radna's going to be collapsed somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that might happen. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> yeah, so we stopped and had a glass of wine, as we do, uh, just to, you know, Make sure that uh, she could make her way back safely. <laughs> <laughs> he fueled yeah. me with alcohol and then just stabbed me yeah, back on my go. way. So I did another Not 30 okay. kilometres back, picked up Roxy, and then yeah. drove back and to then, Yeah, another. so that's, that's when we got to I've just stopped on the photo of um, you and Dean Karnazes in the book Oh, shop. yes. There he is. Yeah. And Dean he's spends a lot, lot, lot of time in a vest. He's shorter than I expected. He's like five foot six or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I gathered that. But Which is weird because um, Scott Jurek, the other super famous ultra runner, is like five foot eleven he's really, or six foot or something. He's really tall. So it just shows you there's no, there is no ultra runner physique, really. No. It's all state of mind. And so I think... Um, I think Dean Karnaz's diet has come more in line with Scott Jurek's now because Scott was yeah, one, of, one of the first plant-based ultra runners. And yeah, uh, whereas... Yeah. He used to eat like fold up, fold up pizzas and somehow yeah. <laughs> pizzas he was and, na and now I think you get to a certain age where I'm, I'm finding this in my running now. If I eat the wrong things, they sit really heavy in my stomach. And, yeah. and the pain that that causes, I'm not talking about a, um, a stitch now, although you get a stitch as well. But the discomfort that causes is more unpleasant than anything the running produces. Um, yeah, digest, digestive issues are can be problematic. And it yeah. um, doesn't help if you just throw anything in there, which is hard to admit. I, w I would have eaten quite badly if her hadn't, hadn't been there because I, yeah, I, I would have had no energy to actually cook anything sensible. So I think <laughs> we were mostly vegetarian during that trip. 
Um, well, I certainly, I can't, maybe only when my dad came briefly to take over for a couple of weeks while I ran, I was looking after a grand. That was probably the only time I had any meat um, during the, the run. Yeah. Mm. So, not necessary. Yes. Oh, you've got a tortoise. <laughs> yeah, um, that was in, um, it was like, and that was uh, fall okay. as well. Yeah, that was, uh, um, I a rare occasion of actually running with someone. Um, I ran his friend Sarah came over uh, to visit for a few days, and we just run up a like annoyingly steep hill at the end of a running day. Um, but because I had someone else there, it was nice and distracting. And then we saw like this tortoise sort of ambling across the road, and it was it wasn't a busy road, but there were enough cars racing up and down it at lunatic speed. I just thought this thing's going to get crushed, so I just sort of picked it up and. Took it hopefully in the direction it was going and deposited it on the other side. <laughs> they they get around those tortoises because I I've, I've seen them in the Kruger National Park in South Africa and I've also come across them when I've been running in Florida of all places. I don't think it's the same ones. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, but the the met the um the running technique of the or the ambling technique of the tortoise is definitely to be um. Uh, recommended. I was going to say they they they're the ones that don't fly, isn't it? So I don't know how <laughs> that's happened. Um, I'm just fascinated by your trainers, mm. Gavin. So what? It looks like you got a pair of Brooks on there. Is that right? Yeah, because I have to get really annoyingly technical for people who don't are not into running. I overpronate quite a lot, so I have a my foot rolls out um, on one side. And Let, let's so just get the, let's get this clear in our heads because I have this problem, but I under pronate. I'm led to believe so. As I'm running, if they're my feet and I'm running mm. like this, my heel tends to turn in, and so as I run forward, the back outside edge scrapes the ground, and then I land as as you're supposed to, right, or as as is more healthy for you so on on the yeah. forefoot so the back outside edges of my trainers run out wear out really really quickly are you saying it's the other i oh, don't no, um i should have to think about it now but we are one of one of the uh, one of the edges of each of my trainers runs out quicker than the other so um uh i tend to have some support to just sort of force my legs into a straight because maybe i'm a bit bandy legged when they're on i don't know I haven't really observed my own gait very often. Do you get pain in your IT bands? Um, That's the outside of your knees, okay. basically. No, I think I, I get pain under my patella of my knee, but I don't know. I don't think it's on one side or the other necessarily. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, my feet are actually quite straight. I think they probably roll in a bit, actually. Yeah, Maybe got you. Yeah. Brooks, yeah. Brooks are really good shoes. They're extremely comfortable. I've just bought two pairs for my next challenge. But the, the only thing I've got, that, I'm in the sort of um, quandary with running shoes because I've never actually found, I've tried it pretty much every brand and I honestly don't think they make a huge amount of difference. Once you wear them in, they're almost equally as good or bad because the less support you have or the less... The less support you have, the more naturally you're forced to run. So you might have to put more effort into running in a natural way by lifting your feet higher and landing on your forefeet, as you're saying. But you'll get less injuries that way. So it's sort of like... Um, but for people who haven't thought too hard about running and haven't really worked on it, maybe supportive shoes are better because you'll, the impact is reduced, etc., etc. So there's, there's all these schools of thought and there's... Vast amounts written about it. Um, did you, um, for this run, did you wear a size bigger shoes or two sizes bigger? No, I, well, I always wear, I always make sure I've got like about um, three quarters of an inch at the front. Um, I very rarely have much space at the side because I've got quite wide feet, so it's quite hard to get. I get the widest fitting and it's still cramped. Yeah, um, I, I just bought Brooks extra wide so not wide yeah. but the extra they're right. yet they're, they're in the post at the moment so i'm looking forward to seeing 
but they're mm. in my actual size. Right. And for people li listening or watching, it's because when you run over a certain distance in a day, so let's just say about marathon distance, your feet s start to swell up and they can actually swell two sizes. And it's then that you start to get the blisters because obviously they're, your toes are bunching into the front of the shoe and I guess pushing your heel out as well. Yeah, um, I haven't really tried. I've not really tried buying different sizes um, to, to change during the day. Did you get many blisters? I got, yeah, I got blisters this time. Um, it's weird. And um, running from John across the Lion's End, I had no blisters whatsoever. This time around, I did have some, um, but n not none of it didn't cripple me in any way. I just you know got them, got a hot needle out, pop them, you know, yeah, got plaster on and keep going, really. Um, they weren't, yeah, they weren't crippling. There was no no real foot trauma. So, um, on your map here, it's Paris to Istanbul. Was that the actual route? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, because that's the route of the Orient, Orient Express. Yeah, so it leaves Gare de l'Est, um, which is um, in the heart of Paris, and and then I headed out along the Marne. Yeah, it's a very it's pretty good. route, actually. Very nice yeah. way to, um, to exit Paris. Yeah, so we, we stopped at the main station stops that the train stopped at, so those cities I mentioned, Paris. Strasbourg, Munich, Vienna, Budapest, Bucharest, Istanbul. And we tried to stop at the correct uh, train station yeah. in each of those uh, cities as well. But the route to get from city to city, we, we sort of winged it. Yeah, yeah because if I'd, if I'd been slavishly following the train tracks, if, I, if I'd been able to, to, to find them, um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have run across the Transalpina in, in Romania because the... The original train route sort of cut down mm. south to avoid the mountains and then went east so i didn't want that experience i wanted to have the experience of like running through the, mm. the carpathian mountains you know of legend and also the alps yeah. as well alps, i mean yeah. the, the bit when we we were in um uh salzburg uh heading up to vienna and we actually rather than just going straight across we sort of did this little loop like that because the Scotsman and Gavin <laughs> saw the Alps and it was like, I know we need to go that way, but I'm going that way. Yeah, so it's, like a, it's like a puppy dog. And why am I forced <laughs> to run on the flat bit? Is that? <laughs> um, wow. So yeah, I did make sure I got up in the Alps amongst the snow. You got some. I, you yeah. got a. You got a quote off Dean Carnazis for your book as well. Yes. Yeah. He um, very kindly um, helped out. That's we had good. to. He inspired the whole. Yeah. Well, he inspired you to start running in the mm -hmm. first place, and he inspired me to yeah. come up with the route. Um, yeah, it just made yeah. it just made sense. Was it difficult to get the quote? Did you just email? Did your publisher just email him, or? Well, um, I think. Well, <laughs> Aradna basically made friends with him. <laughs> she was tweeting uh, throughout the and keeping up the social media throughout the adventure. So uh, I think he sent quite a few tweets his way. Um, and he replied. Well, you um, know, we we bonded. <laughs> there's this, there's yeah. this bit, it's really ridiculous, sorry, but it's quite funny. Um, when I was reading his book, there's this bit uh, where he's doing some training runs in Greece. Um, so his family is from Greece, um, although he grew up in America. I yeah. think. Well, he lives in America now. And, um, and he was about to do um, the, you know, the Spartathlon and um and everyone knew him he's really famous so he kept he was passing this little shop somewhere in the wilderness and they spotted him and recognized him and, and the man beckoned him in from his run and gave him a watermelon <laughs> and, um, so it just thought it was hilarious and he basically had to carry on the rest of his marathon training holding run a, carrying this watermelon. giant watermelon yeah. and this became his route every time he went past this this really kind man in the shop would give him a watermelon and Dean was like oh that's really kind thank you and obviously couldn't leave it so kept <laughs> and um I think Dean probably didn't get this because he was probably never a teenage girl in the 90s but um <laughs> for those of you who were a teenage girl in the 90s you were probably obsessed with dirty dancing as I was and there's this scene in dirty dancing where um where the uh 
where, where Baby first meets Patrick Swayze and goes, oh, I carried a watermelon. I just, I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I, I think I tweeted and, and I was just like, I've just been reading Dean's book and basically he carried a watermelon. And so then after that, every year, apparently there's a National Watermelon Day. Oh, no. Dean would tweet me and say hi, and I would send him a picture of a watermelon. <laughs> it just became this thing. They should have a race now in Greece in his honour where you yeah, have to run. Well, ideally, with two, two watermelons would be easier because it would balance you. Mm-hmm. If you've got big enough hands, one in each hand. I think anyone who has to do it would refute that. <laughs> so I'm going to make a guess here. Aradna, do you have an iPhone? I do, yeah. And you took that stunning picture of Gavin that's on the cover of his book. No, actually, that one was, <laughs> um, that I can't take credit for that. Um, so I, for two weeks um, in Romania, sadly, when you did the amazing mm. Carpathians, I, my gran um, needed a carer and after my parents went away. So I had to um, leave our trip for a couple of weeks and Gavin's dad um, took over, which I think was an amazing experience for him. Yeah. I think two weeks was probably enough. But um, yeah, so I that photo was taken by your dad, Ian. Yeah. Does your dad have an iPhone, Gavin, just out of interest? Uh, he does not. He doesn't, actually. So I'm afraid if your theory is that iPhones take the best photographs, it might not be correct. In this no, what it is, is I've noticed through doing the podcast that iPhones... Yeah. Um, they do this bizarre thing. I'm not sure if it's just with video and stills, but they use the old, the old form, the old um, dimensions. So everyone obviously uses nine sixteen now, which is what for people at home. That's what you're seeing the zoom picture in now. That's nine sixteen, whereas the kind of if you can call it old school is the more square television, the old school television set size. Well, you, when, you have a choice of formats, and I have to admit, I quite often, when I'm when I'm taking photographs on a run, I quite often see something that I think is going to be Instagram friendly. So I'll take it in a square format, so I get the most pixels from my from my money. Um, yes, bloody Instagram! Yeah. They've screwed it up for all of us. <laughs> I wonder whether your dad probably used a real camera. Yeah, what? actually, he yeah he probably did. He's quite old school. He has. He used to take photographs for the National Trust for Scotland. So if you want someone to take photographs mm. of mountains, then he's your man. <laughs> he is also an artist and a graphic designer. So, I mean, the yes. man knows what he's doing. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, you met a lot of lovely people we can see. I'm, we're, I've got to the end of your photos now. Mm. So I'm going to put us back on the big screen. There we are. Et voila. Yeah, you looks like you met some hos- hospitable people and you're camping with them around the fire. Yeah. Oh, um, the yeah, was, yeah we, well, we'd, we'd driven for quite a while trying to find somewhere to pitch up for the night and Aradna's friend David was over. We ended up in the Austrian, in these beautiful pastures and this um, hillsides in Austria. But we we just didn't know where the hell we were and we found this pri- what looked like a private road and we were sort of driving to this beautifully manicured um, farmland, thinking this isn't right, we shouldn't be here. So, well, but then you spotted someone by the side of the road. Yeah, we were so lost, and I was, I was really fed up. I've been driving around for ages, and we'd gone up some little road, and this is absolutely, you know, this terrifying moment where in the van we were going up quite a steep, um, like one, one road, a single file thing. And uh, and a car came the other way, and I remember having to. I just passed a crossing point and having to reverse. So I I was absolutely done. I was so tired and fed up. And then trundling trundling along, going past this big farmhouse, thinking I think we might be trespassing. And there was this girl on the side planting seeds. And I remember there was eye contact. She just looked up and smiled, and I smiled. And I was just trundling along on on, them, on her land. And then we got to a bit where I was like, okay, that is definitely private road. Mm. And I didn't think twice. I kind of grabbed the sat nav that had taken me up this way, jumped out and ran back to this girl and she ran over. And um, it turned out it was her parents' farm. She was visiting. She'd been um, a nurse in um, Luntz, which is the town nearby. And, um, and she'd actually just been traveling herself and she was just, delighted to see us trespassing she said you know I very rarely get to 
meet new people here on the farm and I just asked if she knew somewhere that we could park up and sleep for the night. Her mum came out, her mum was just, just lovely and was immediately like, well, obviously you should stay here. So they pointed us towards this little spot on their farmland where we could happily and safely stay and then and then Maria, the girl who was uh, planting the seeds, and actually her mum's also Maria. So Maria and her sister Elizabeth came over um, while we were cooking dinner and said, oh, we're just about to get a campfire going. Do you want to come and join us? And it was probably, I think probably my favourite night. There's, mm. there's quite a few of really amazing nights, actually. But we ended up going down to the farm and sitting by the campfire, and they'd made... Maria Senior had just been um, making bread for the next day, as you do. And so they had like a dough. And so we we had these sticks and you wrap the dough and like, you know, kind of press it onto the stick and then toast it in the mm. fire and then eat that dipped in sauce. And, yeah, really and nice. Maria is the second of seven children. The eldest wasn't there. The others, you know, were coming and going. So I think there were about five of them. And then her dad... Joseph came to join us as well. It was my friend David was visiting us at the time and had just turned 40. Um, and it was just one of those moments where we'd just met this family and we were all just there around this campfire on this farm. I don't even know where in Austria. I couldn't tell you exactly where we were. Um, and Maria Senior, she'd actually travelled a lot um, when she was younger before she was married. Um, and uh, just got a guitar out and it was just one of those moments that yeah. you know it sounds so she cliche start, she but it singing just happened. country roads by john denver it's, <laughs> it's quite you know surreal it was quite surreal and like given that you know what a couple of hours before mm. we we're just driving around and i thought i think i'm done with this i just i can't I can't do it. I don't know where to park. I'm really tired. I'm fed up. That did happen more than once, actually. There was another moment where you were um, at the end of your tether, because I think you'd, Aradna was trying to make a short film on the concept of home, and she just met this this paddle boarder guy who was married to the Thai woman, and they had a, a food van. And the idea was to interview them for her film, but for whatever reason, we didn't manage to cut with them. And it was just getting a bit demoralizing. And, we stopped by the side of this lake, and it was a lovely sunset, so it was quite idyllic, but I think you, you'd reach the end of your tether and sort of... Well, I think I was just, <laughs> I, I kind of felt a bit fed up of my yeah. my life just being, mm. you know, going from A to B. I, I felt like I was missing out on having those human connections. I was seeing some beautiful things, but mm. you were off doing your adventure, and I, I felt like, for me, it's all about the people that I would meet on the way and I was just getting I, I was getting a bit frustrated about that and I also I missed that conviviality of sitting with friends and just having a glass of wine and just you know real life I was sort of a bit sick of always being on adventure and wanted a, a slice of normality yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. So and that's it's quite you... um I mean it's a big achievement driving to Istanbul and I'm assuming you drove back again. That yeah it's um you can't underestimate the the importance of uh, and the challenge of support you know this is one thing that's not written enough about in a lot of these um running adventure books is the role of the support person or support team some of them have teams yeah um because you you know you thought that you'd have a lot as you said i thought you'd have quite a lot of free time and i thought you'd have a lot of free time but it turns out you know no you're li when you're living in a van you've got you've got to make sure you've got water you've got somewhere to park you've got find somewhere to source food, diesel, um, somewhere to stay for the night, you know, and all of these challenges can take up an hour or two, you know, so there's not really a lot of time left yeah. really once you once you factor all that in. But the funny thing was that you do, I remember thinking, you know, people who travel alone, and I know that, Chris, you had this, you know, when you just kept saying that the people that you meet and, you know, the, the kindness of strangers, I, I suppose, that... It, it was often in those moments, so that moment where I was feeling a bit frustrated and actually Gavin, you really spotted that and you took us to, you found this lake that we could park near at uh, Kimsey, the most beautiful spot, this absolutely fiery sunset, uh, really close to the Alps, so the Alps were lit up pink across this really icy 
very, very sort of grey blue, very still lake. And you just think, I remember thinking, okay, it's all right. I don't need normal anymore. This, I mean, <laughs> what could you possibly hope for with this? And this woman steps out from the trees. I mean, genuinely, I've known, well, I now know yeah. where she came from. But it was deserted. And then this woman just stepped out. But it looked like she stepped out of a bush. <laughs> and then, yeah. Like and then, she'd been cued by an off, off-camera director. I, right now. I mean, the same as um, the sunlight in this far. Like, yeah. It feels like such a movie moment. And it really was. It was magic. But it was just spontaneous and natural. And Gavin and I just sitting there, sort of taking this scene. And she just steps out, kicks the trainers off, and walks into the lake. And she's just thinking... What is happening? Yeah. And she's just, you know, paddling in the, the water and we just get chatting and she comes over and she speaks really good English. This is in Germany. We have a really, really lovely chat. And then she, she goes, oh, we, we have a little um, cottage, you know, just just over there, hence stepping out from the trees because she has a little path. Would you like to come for a glass of wine? And I, honestly, I felt like singing hallelujah. <laughs> it was just, you know... And we had such a beautiful evening. We ended up, she said, you must bring your van in and park it on our driveway. You know, don't, don't stay in a car park. Um, come and sit with us. Uh, met her husband, who was lovely, had some local beers, glass of wine, looking over the lake. Um, Listen to a Hawaiian slack key guitar for fans of such things. Mm. Yeah, lovely. And, and yeah, and then, I mean, we're still in touch with all these mm friends who kind of just kept us energized to keep going again the next day mm. yeah so it wasn't all endured i mean i think this is probably going to be the most idyllic sounding uh, podcast <laughs> in in the series of podcasts that you've done you know because most of your most of your uh uh guests are like bootnecks who've been uh, marched across deserts and fought in <laughs> in waters <laughs> and we're here we're describing <laughs> sipping wine listening to hawaiian music hey this yeah. it's called bought the t-shirt podcast for a reason um <laughs> I, I love well, the I love these chats, Gavin. You know, I wish um, I'd love to do a, a, a lot more of them. It's a problem with it, with YouTube is is it works on a certain algorithm, and I am right. not a person that works on any kind of algorithm. I just want to chat to who I want to chat to. Yeah. So in in a way, purely from a, a professional point of view, I cut my nose off to spite my face, but it's. You know, I live my life, I do what I want to do. and So, Gavin, you were going to read some of your book. Yeah, there, there are, you know, in contrast to that, there were there were some scary, challenging moments. Um, maybe we'll talk about the Turkish um, presidential election before we sign off. But before, before we get into that adventure, um, I've just got a little vignette, which is about uh, running through the Strangia region in Bulgaria and coming across some local wildlife um, unexpectedly. So. so we're very near the border, uh, actually, with Turkey at this point. So. I've begun to see border patrol cars prowling the roads along which I now run, looking for intrepid and illegal immigrants from Turkey coming through the nearby fields. It won't be long now. If not today, then tomorrow will see me enter Europe's sole Muslim-majority nation. Too conspicuous to be of real concern to the police, or so I think. I run past warehouses, then find a footpath out into forested countryside, leaving the tarmac for the relief of a trail. During a brief pee stop, I hear the, the voices of a man and woman calling to their horses, or so I imagine, but I never see the riders. A little later, I run past a group of loggers, their truck parked in a clearing, having a cigarette break. As I run past, I nod hello, but nobody seems especially concerned or interested in my presence. Clouds of midges now join the party swarming around my jacket shrouded head. Um, I find myself following a gurgling river, an experience I've not had since the Carpathians. Everything seems to be going well, until the path abruptly turns down to the river and stops, leaving me floundering amongst the rocks, scratching my head for a way forward. Wondering if I can hop over the rocks to the other side of the river without falling in, I begin to doubt the sense of the route Google Maps has found for me. This path through the woods has evidently not been travelled by anyone for years. Still, some shreds of it must remain, I hope, as I teeter over the river, plunging the habitual single foot accidentally into the flow. Optimism always wins over common sense. 
my trail finding takes on an architectural, ar sorry, archaeological dimension, sending me back in time, past the overgrown remains of a long crumbled ancient bridge and roadway. I force myself through bushes and over fallen tree trunks, eventually finding the preserved remains of a road, which clearly hasn't been in use for at least 60 years. It once took locals through the forest, but now the forest has taken it back. The Notta Road sidles around rocky cliffs and cuts through densely packed trees until abruptly I hit a 10 meter wide gap, two meters deep, where a hunk of the road surface has seemingly been bitten away. I clamber down and up the other side of the mini ravine and press on, very sure that I'm on a path taken by nobody at all in recent memory. It is both exciting and frightening at the same time. If this way becomes impassable, what on earth will I do? My pace slows to a crawl with short stretches of running where ancient tarmac winds out briefly over the underbrush. I have no phone signal, so I can't send a text, and my situation isn't quite problematic enough to warrant an email from the Garmin. I have an allowance of only a handful of these per month. In a strange way, the sound of distant logging, chainsaws and yelling are almost comforting. I'm not the only human out here. I follow the mendacious blue line on Google Maps to a perilously steep forest path only to discover it's veering off me off in entirely the wrong direction. I backtrack to where I missed the junction. This route is so long gone that all navigational definitions no longer make sense, and try again. Finally, the road becomes a recently maintained gravel path, and as I feel my feet lift once more into a trot, I hear a strange snort from somewhere to my left, and squint through a gap in the hedgerow to see something that chills my blood and excites me in equal measure. Wild boar, at least eight of them, as large as cabs and a lot more dangerous, the creatures rumble on heavy hooves toward and past me on a thankfully parallel path. Jet black with long tusks, shoulder muscles piled over one another like boulders, the herd is magnificent and terrifying in equal measure. In a moment, it's gone, leaving only the echo of hooves and the memory of something almost primeval. My thoughts wander to what I'd have done if they had charged towards me on my own path, and I find myself unable to formulate sensible answer do you think i'll end there <laughs> <laughs> god i must be a bit primal because whenever i hear about wild boars i just get hungry <laughs> <laughs> i think of the, yeah. bur the burgers that my mate makes out of them <laughs> sorry That's to cool. all the animal lovers out there meat but eater, meat eater is still deep inside you somewhere mm. so right two things i wanted to ask and then i'm going to ask you guys what your what your you know what 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 your next plans is on the on this amazing highway called life or what what challenges this is um maybe further inspired you to do uh, did you run for a charity gavin when you wanted to ask you that um i raised a little bit of money for two mobility charities uh whiz kids and limb power um uh, I didn't raise a huge amount of money, but I, yeah, I raised a little bit along the way. Okay. Uh, Can people... that, those are my sort of ongoing charities that I try to uh, try to work with whenever I do one of these adventures. Can you just give them to me again, and I'll put a link for those charities below the video. And... Yeah, sure. Um, limb Power. Is that limb as in arms and legs? Yes, that's, that's a charity for uh, recent uh, amputees trying to... Um, become uh, physically able again and take part in sports activities and things. Uh, and then there's Whiz Kids and what they do is they provide um, better wheelchairs and mobility aids to children um, who are just otherwise given, you know, the, the bog standard um, NHS wheelchairs that you manually trundle along. Yes, yes, yeah. that's an Im important thing when you're in that, that situation. So for me, for me, it's like, um, my stuff is about what amazing things I can do with my body. And I sort of, I feel, you know, bad for people who, who don't have those opportunities. But I think with, with those, what those charities are about is allowing people who have mobility issues to, to be more active. So. And the final thing I was going to ask you, did you put on weight or did you lose weight or did you stay the same? Oh, no, I've definitely lost weight. So I think, um, I think I went down to about, um, maybe six or seven percent fat at the end. Um, I, I had a six pack for the first and possibly only time in my life <laughs> uh, by the end of it. Um, so all you need to do, people, to uh, gain a six pack is just run 20 miles a day for 110 days. 
uh, yeah, just, just, just run to Istanbul. <laughs> That's all. Um, the benefit of running the Orient Express as opposed to taking the train is hmm. Agatha Christie doesn't kill you. <laughs> you don't get no. murdered. No, but I, I did think um, I did think that there was a chance that I might end up in a Turkish prison. Um, I won't I won't tell the whole story in great detail because it's in the book and I want people to read, to buy it. <laughs> hmm. But I did. I did take a foolish wrong turn um, crossing the, um, the mountains outside this Turkish town called Viz, where I accidentally somehow managed to wander into a military base. Um. Somehow, <laughs> somehow, you know, like when you cross that fence, which admittedly had fallen on the ground, but you decided to trample over yeah. it and ignore all the signs. All the signs that were in is. Turkish, and I don't read Turkish, so... Uh, so it I, doesn't count. Yeah, I sort of... <laughs> I came across this hill and there's a little sentry post um, and there's these two young soldiers. They look like they're on military service because they're only about 18 or 19 or something. And they've both got rifles and one's smoking a cigarette and they're both chatting, looking in the opposite direction. And I'm running towards them at speed and light. Right? <laughs> and I think probably running at two young men with rifles and surprising them is not the best, is not the best notion. So I start going, excuse me, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then they they're baffled they don't know what to do but they they sort of and they don't speak english so i'm like running running sort of miming running foolishly and um they call for support and they this um you probably know the name of them better than i do but this massive all-terrain vehicle comes up like a people carrier thing and uh i i'm encouraged up into the cab <laughs> and then the chap who i i'm guess i'm guessing he's like a lieutenant or something, he sort of uh, starts talking to me in English, says, oh, I, I'm a runner too, and he, sees, he runs 10k a day, so I'm like, oh, we make friends, this is going to be okay, but then he drives me down to the base, and then I'm taken into this little, um, tiny little chamber, opposite an even more senior officer, like one stage up perhaps from that, and he doesn't speak much English, and I'm sort of thinking, oh, shit, uh, I mean, this is the day of the presidential election in Turkey, which is quite controversial because there's some rumours that Erdogan might might not be. Um, how how should we, you know, how should we say this? It might not have been entirely democratic. Might not be entirely democratic. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm being interrogated, you know, very convivially, thankfully, and I I can only I haven't I can't really text, you know, because they're not really going to just let me do whatever I want. I'm sort of under a kind of house arrest, I guess. And uh, but I do manage to say, can I just text my 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 girlfriend? She's waiting for me somewhere. So I text something like, "Hi, I'm with some Turkish soldiers. They're giving me tea. <laughs> Maybe some time." <laughs> so they, they gave me a cup of tea, and as soon as I got that, I thought, "Well, anyone offers you tea, they're not probably going to string you up by your heels and hit you with sticks." Um, yeah. And that, eventually, it was fine. They were very, they were very friendly. I managed to show them the visa on my phone, the only form of ID I had um, that I'd entered the country legally, although admittedly on foot, which is kind of unusual. And, nice, um, tea, nice tea in Turkey as well. Yeah, very, very nice. Lots um, of sugar they have it with, don't they? Yeah, slightly. It was slightly disturbing when one of them passed me his phone, where he's using Google Translate to communicate with him, and he said, "Erdogan won." exclamation mark and he goes haha and I, I look at it and I go yeah and I, I is he being ironic is he pro Erdogan is he is he saying that uh, so I just I just try to remain as natural as possible and they, they just they let us on our way but it was yeah it was quite a that was quite a hairy moment because I don't know if you've seen Midnight Express but <laughs> that was you don't want to be in a Turkish prison <laughs> if you can avoid it <laughs> Then there was a time that you, yeah. at least you went to Turkey legally, there was also mm. the time when you were an illegal immigrant in Romania. Yeah, well, I thought, you know, just to be different, I'd break into Romania. So, uh... and, and the time when you had a police escort to yeah. the border in Bulgaria as well. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't unfraught. It's, it's quite difficult, it turns out, to run across borders. Um, because although, even if, even if they're in the Schengen Agreement in Europe, where... Um, you know, and there's only nominal borders. There's still someone there to look at your passport and just check that you're legit. Well, and this wasn't in the Schengen. No, no, but but well, we thought I thought naively that Romania was part of the Schengen Accord. I just didn't think, you know. And I saw this little barrack. 
it was literally one white metal bar and a sentry post and nobody at it and the sign said Romania and I thought oh great so I ducked under it and just kept running <laughs> I don't know, there's a car. That was your first clue, wasn't it? There's a, there was a <laughs> police car, or un, it was an unmarked police car, parked about a few hundred yards out, and these two burly men came out. So, yeah, basically told me to delete all the photos from my phone and send me back over the border, and then I had to come back, having just crossed the legitimate border at a sensible crossing point. She had to do a U turn and come back and get me. And what was it? What was it like getting to Istanbul Station? That your oh, your RV. It was such a relief. Um, but by that point, I'd sort of normalised the process of running. So it wasn't like I staggered across the finish line on my last legs. You know, I, I basically sort of jogged happily <laughs> up to the station. And, you know. In fact, the only reason you were slower was just because it was really busy, so you were dodging. Yeah. Because we we didn't generally we stayed away from cities and except yeah. the main stops. We we wanted to be out in the countryside where mm. it was easier to run, easier to park, and you know wild camp. Yeah. But yeah, obviously running through Istanbul. I I remember because I was waiting there for you. We did um uh, you know with celebratory yeah. things, and um the only reason you were a bit slow is you were dodging in between people on the pavement. Yeah, I mean I I. I... It, that was the one strangest thing after being so long in the middle of nowhere, like running through the, uh, the wilderness in Bulgaria and the small villages in Turkey, to suddenly find yourself in a, in a major city and and see other runners finally, like a few few people running. Like, wow, wow. Because I hadn't, people, here's the thing nobody runs like east of, of Austria. No, it's not. Uh, it's not if, really, you, if not you're running there, there, you're normally running from a me a brutal dictator or something or running away from dogs yeah yes. I, I i literally had had dozens and dozens of do encounters with feral dogs in romania that's a whole other story but it's in the book as to the history of why that happened final thing then guys so how am i going to get on i'm i'm going to attempt to run yeah two, 200 miles Around a track. Yeah, I'm saying non-stop, and by non-stop, what I mean is I'm not going to take like three weeks to do it or something. I, it's yeah. going to be like a one-off thing. Whether right. I need to get my head down for a couple of hours here and there will remain to be seen. It's around a, a tent standing by, I think, to go and lie down for a bit. Yeah, I'm hoping that the running track will let me use their. Um, oh, I better. I've just got to write that down. I've got to call them today. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping they're going to let me uh, use their changing room um, as a sort of, you know, I don't know, we have a cooker in there or something, or a kettle at least, and maybe an ice box or something. Um, and the idea is that the monotony of running 800 laps around a track yeah. is representing the monotony of being homeless. The, yeah. The boredom factor, again, the, the same thing. The fact I'm giving up some, if not all, of my Christmas is is kind of my... Um, yeah, are, are you prepared for it to go more than two days? Because it... Yeah, it, um, it, it, will, it will take whatever it takes. Obviously, the quicker I get done, if I can get it done in two and a half days or two and a quarter days, then I get home on Christmas Eve. If not, then I have to start plodding the streets because they'll shut the run running track. But I will, I will get it done by hook or by crook. Um, and yeah, I'm highlighting the issue of homelessness, which is something that affects uh, more. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the right word, but per ratio, affects more ex-service people than it than than anybody than any other any other group is what I'm trying to say. Um, as with my last two challenges, so the running the UK and my quadruple distance Ironman, mm. I'm, I try to raise awareness of veterans' mental health issues and also demonstrate as someone that's been there that there's there's a real great life once you once you yeah, yeah. you know change a few paradigms in your head um, and learn to deal with trauma rather than let it sort of control you. Mm. So that's it. So yeah, I'm going to be hitting the running track on the 22nd and running. Um, yeah. 
there's a yeah, deep... your, your mental state is going to be the big even though it might sound crazy to say that physical issues aren't going to be the big problem but actually because it's running round and round and round and round the track i think your mental state will be the thing to focus on um particularly when it gets i, I don't know how much sleep you're planning on getting but uh, if you're running through the night that's going to be quite a challenge as well because the, the only way i managed to run through the night was by being in a beautiful place where i can look at the trees and listen to the sound of the birds and so i don't know how how much uh, you have to sort of distract your mind or to keep you on the straight and narrow while you're while you're dealing with it yeah well i worked out if i listen to audio books or or a podcast and the podcasts are three hours long it's only x amount of podcasts i've got to listen to and then i'm finished right so well and, and you should hold off on try to do as much of it as you can without and it sounds like completely weird advice but try and do as much without any audio assistance mm. until you get to the point where you really need it because when you when you then use it as a sort of recovery or survival strategy then it's so much more beneficial otherwise it just becomes background and then you won't have the benefit. It's like, you know, like your grand says, don't put on your coat in the house, <laughs> wait till you're outside and cold and then put on. Um, yeah, there's a big area of not, not knowing for me because yeah. obviously I can go by the, the, the 24 hour race we did where you guys all managed to knock off like a hundred miles. But then there was a slight terrain there, wasn't there? It wasn't, it, it certainly wasn't as flat as a running track. Yeah, there was a few hills, N nothing huge, but there were hills, wasn't there? There were a couple of little, yeah, little hills that you'd have to, you end up walking. And there was some running across grass, I seem to remember, or, or fields. Yeah, some slippery bits by the end, because you've had a thousand runners traipsing around the same thing dozens and dozens of times. Yeah, pretty and, grim. and then there was a lane, about a half a mile lane, wasn't there, we had to run up. Yeah. And then, of course, every time you wanted food or drink, you had to actually sort of stop, go back to your tent or whatever it might be, sort that out and then continue. Whereas for me, that's not going to be an issue because it will just be a case of drink. Thank you. You have a table with you can have snacks on a table or something. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm not going to like overthink this. I'm just going to sort of hit the running track, plonk, a, plonk stuff on the side of the track. Yeah. There, there's there'll be no shortage of volunteers to help me. Um, so you're going to have people run with you at times? Just yeah, to... people are welcome to come and yeah. run. I'm, I'm not almost, I'm not always the most sociable runner simply because yeah. for a start, it's quite a meditative experience for me being in the zone. That doesn't yeah. mean at times it's not really nice to just have someone to chat to. But... Yeah, I'm the same. I sort of, I, I prefer to do 90% of it by myself, but, Every so often, it's nice to have yeah. something else to share with. What, what I found really hard on my joggle towards the end, because mm. nobody met me in Scotland, there's just nobody up, there's no, no one really going to come and meet you in the Highlands. To, But when I got into England, people started to appear. Yeah. And it it either went one or both ways. Either they really supported you or they it, it was a bit of a hindrance, to be honest. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to try and be sociable and... And it's nice. just it's just little things like when I'm hanging out I mean when I'm really I'm just exhausted but I'm I'm yeah. still going it's like I don't want someone running in front of me yeah. it's like I don't need a pacemaker or something right yeah. and and mentally it it kills my buzz Gavin you know it, 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 it believe it or not you can have a buzz when you're absolutely physically shattered You've got something going on in your head that keeps you going. And when someone like is running out front, as if to say, come on, come on, it it, it, kill, it kills that adrenaline. That would be kind of uh, annoying. Yeah, it's, it's difficult because nobody, they won't really understand what, where your head is at at that point. It's not something that most people will yeah. ever experience. And the, and, the, and the other thing as well, and I've been fiercely independent ever since I was a kid, my grand would try and hold my hand across the road when I was five and I would just always shake. I hated it. I hate it. It's just part of my personality, right? And it's 
when people come and join you and then they start telling you what to do, it's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> you know, right, no, Chris, no, 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 no. Right, we're going to get you a hot bath and, right, get him some, and it's like, shush, shut up. If I wanted that, I'd ask for it. Thank you very much. Just just let me do my thing. This is, <laughs> yeah. I sound really... Well, they're only trying to be helpful, but it's, it can be a little misguided at times if you... Yeah. It's difficult to find that balance of not wanting to seem... What's the word? Ungrateful. Well, but, you know, you know, on a running yeah. running track, you've got the little trough that the yeah. what's it? Oh yeah. You know where they put the water for this? What's that steeple chase or something? Yeah. I'm only trying to be helpful when I push them in there. <laughs> and I'm yeah. gonna and it's gonna I'm gonna fill it with piranhas as well. <laughs> no, you might, you might find you want to jump in there as well to get your legs. Um, What's well, the <laughs> when they're really painful, when they're really aching, yeah, it's really nice. Well, I'm going to take, um, I've got a kind of utility box that I bought for yeah. my, my little boy's toys, you know, like a big box. Mm. And I've just realised it, it's there's no holes in it, so it's waterproof. Oh. And I think I might fill it up, you know, two thirds with water and then just get the, the crew to chuck the odd bag of ice in there. Yeah, um, that, that'll, that'll definitely help. When I got... 10 miles from Land's End, my IT bands in the outside of my knees were so painful. Mm. Even taking painkillers and, and drinking tots of rum, they <laughs> were still agony. Yeah. I mean, agony as in I could run 500 metres and that was it, I had to stop. Mm. And the guys had this spray ice because we couldn't get any proper ice and they were just oh, yeah. Yeah. holding this spray ice on my knees for like 20, 30 seconds at a time. Then I was massaging them like this, and then I could run for another 500 meters, and then we had to stop and do it. It was yeah. Yeah. utter agony. So I'm hoping an ice bath on the side of the track might. Um, if well, we had... I know that from experience because I I took, took part in a study at Middlesex Uni, and they made us run a marathon, and then they dumped me in six degree water. Um, up to my waist after the marathon. It's the most agonizing thing I've ever experienced. But immediately after I got out, I could run up and down stairs. I could, like, after a marathon, I would not normally, you know, run at a proper speed. Mm. I would not normally be able to walk around very easily. And the next day I was I was strolling around like nothing had happened. It was so incredible. It just, it just stopped all the swelling from happening, the, you know, the, the sort of post-traumatic, period of, of um, all your muscles, whatever happened, the tissues, you know, um, inflaming, basically inflammation of the tissues that have been torn, that's what's happening. Yeah. So the ice stops that. So yeah, that's, that would definitely do it. I don't so, know if this is helpful on a short run, but, and it comes with no scientific basis, <laughs> but I'm, I'm running the Orient. Um, you, Gavin, didn't have any um, injuries and and was actually really yeah. fit and i i think part of the reason for that was that he wasn't just running so we were living in a mm. tiny van so there was lots of lots of bending and stretching and twisting you know just to get things pull the bed out so we could mm. sleep um on yeah. the few days off that we had so we had a day off in each of those cities um and then one or two days where we just had to do admin stuff, you know, things were broken with the van that I couldn't cope with by myself. Um, so on the on the days off, um, you weren't just sitting with your feet up, you were either right. fixing the van yeah. or yeah, or on the cities we were walking for miles and miles and miles. Um and and actually that helped, I think, keep you in good shape so that you didn't have injuries because I suppose you were working your whole body rather than just the same muscle so i don't know how that translates to when you're doing a very intense run only for a few days mm -hmm. but things like you know things like stretching or yeah. you know if you have all body a stretching sleep or do a bit of yoga or whatever it is just something else twisting getting your back muscles going yeah. i mm -hmm. think those sorts of things actually help strengthen your whole body and and that's why compared mm -hmm. to your juggle run where you were constantly having injuries this was much longer you didn't have a single injury or yeah. back pain and or anything with the 24 because i've done three of those 24 hour races and uh the longer i stopped to rest and sat down the worse it was 
Right. What's the What's the longest you've run on those ones, then, Gavin? Uh, well, I did. There was a, one I did with you. It was 102 miles. I went back twice after that, but I only managed 96. And I just either it's just getting older, or I just had a bad day. But um, I don't know. I something just went right that day, that first time. Uh, and it might be something to do with the novelty or the fact that there weren't too many runners. Um, but yeah, I think that. And I was just able to push through the pain a lot more. On subsequent occasions, I think I just, um, I think maybe I did allow myself to rest too much. Or, because the thing is, time will, as soon as you sit down, time accelerates massively. This is really weird. I'm like, I would say to her, oh, I've only been here five minutes. Like, lunch, uh, we stopped for lunch on running the Orient. And I think I'd been there for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And she'd say, you've been here an hour, get back out there. <coughs> so, yeah, I, I know you, you will have to rest and you will have to stop and stretch and eat and everything, but just try and keep that, try and keep that down to a minimum um, and keep moving even when you're, even when you're resting. It's like yeah. sitting, is a night, sitting and lying down, is, is your body desperately wants to do it, but as soon as you do it, everything starts seizing up. Like, ah, you know, the muscles will just start trying, just really rebelling because they think they've stopped. They, they don't know that you're going to do it again. Go on, yeah. yeah. So what's next for you guys then? What any is this inspired you to do something else? I'm guessing it has. Well, you probably just want to travel more once you're allowed out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's not necessarily running related, but the, the thing for me, I I love traveling in that way. Mm. Um, you write about this a lot in your books about you know the way that you see the world. It's it's not just flying in somewhere, seeing a city for a couple of days and flying out. It's all the bits in between that no one ever sees. I absolutely love the van. I love wild camping, swimming in lakes and rivers. I, I want to, yeah, it's got the travel bug in me and it, it changes the way that you want to travel and the way that you want to interact with people and see the world. And in life, it's about, you know, to get overly philosophical, but it's about... Mm, you know, kind of being inspired and just thinking, well, let's give something a try, taking risks and therefore getting bigger rewards, um, pushing yourself, putting yourself into uncomfortable situations. Um, I think that's what has changed me. I, I'm just desperate to travel when we can. I bet. All of us, I think. And Gavin, yeah. what's what's up for you? Have you got anything on the running front? Well, I've got, I'm, I'm working on a project at the moment uh, called 50 at 50. Because I hit that um, terrifying age barrier <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, and I celebrated by running 50 miles um, down the uh, canal from uh, where was I again? Leighton Buzzard to uh, to Brentford, um, and that's to kickstart this project where I'm going to do 50 different runs. They don't all need to be ultras, you know. Some of them will be short runs. I want to do a park run. I've never done one, believe it or not. Mm. Um, but some of them are ultra races. I've always wanted to do. Admittedly, because of COVID, a lot of races are still cancelled or, or, or virtual. So I'm probably going to do a lot of more self-set challenges. Like there's the Capital Ring, which is 65 miles around London. And then I want to go and run the West Highland Way again. And I want to run up the East, um, the uh, Fife East Coast Trail, which is like 160 miles or something. Did you run the West Highland Way when it was dry? uh not entirely no <laughs> i ran it in a storm yeah and all i had was my training shoes and there was rivers running across that way every at some points to every 200 meters yeah, it wasn't as bad as that but yeah it's, it can be brutal up there so yeah when i got up. when i got to um what's that village when you descend down into it? it's the first village in in oh. in the nation to have electricity Oh, is that um, Kinlock Levin? Oh yeah, yeah, Kinlock yeah. Levin. Yes, with there where there's the um the big hydro hydro power station and everything, or hydro pipes. Yeah, when I got to there and I went across to the Devil Staircase, then I just stayed on the road again. It was just much. It was so much easier to run on the road. Yeah, mm. it's, it's it's a struggle. But um, so hopefully I'll knock off these fifty runs, and I'm I'm going to write about each one just a few pages. Um, just to, as a way of um, as a way of keeping busy without having to plan another epic that's going to cost a fortune. 
Mm-hmm. But I do have this sort of this little this little tweak of an idea, which is basically Patagonia. So just to your right <laughs> on the world map. Yeah, I, I've I've got a map there, and I've, yeah, I've, got, I've pink, got one here. Pink so it's <laughs> so quite well down down southern like, tip of yeah, Argentina. Like, anyway. So um, there's a trail that's just opened up. Um, it's not really an official trail, but some long distance through hikers have kind of created this this um, route, and it goes all the way to the bottom of of America from sort of half uh, halfway up South America. So it's going to be about four, no three. I think it's about three and a half thousand miles or something. Wow, because we so, had um, Jamie Ramsey on the podcast the other day, yeah. and he ran from uh, Vancouver to Tierra del Fuego. Right. So he ran from Vancouver wow. yeah. to, to the tip of South. I think it was that's, the tip of South. Either way, it was a long way. It might have been chilly, but it was a long way down. Um, yeah. I think that, the only problem with it is just the time. It's just the time. I mean, I would do it like you did. I'll, do, I'll try and do it unsupported. Well, I'll try and do it with a tent and a pack and everything. But even, even allowing for, the, for making it a, a real budget adventure, the time that's going to take, the time out of work, is the is the hardest challenge, I think. Yeah, <laughs> harder than running through the Andes, <laughs> I think. And I'm sure I'd meet people. I'm sure I'd have lovely encounters and amazing experiences and adventures. But it's just trying to figure out the economics. So if I could get some, if I can try and drum up some sort of supporters, some sort of sponsor, then it would be it will become a possibility. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to save up. And I'm going to have to have more local adventures in the meantime. Well, that's what happened. But yeah. we were we while we were still coming back from Istanbul, um, we were mad keen on um, New Zealand. Yeah, but that was the other one. There's um, that the, could happen. What's yeah. it called? The yeah. Te Arawara Trail runs from the top of North Island uh, to the bottom of South Island, and it goes through some absolutely staggering scenery. Mm-hmm. Obviously, so Lord there of the was, um, there was a, a a 60 if not older years old man that that mm. ran that got the world record for that recently he yeah he, he did something like 60 miles a day running that's the amazing. length, length yeah, of new zealand that's incredible and so, i think that's a really good support to do on as well because there's loads of yeah. you know they've set it up with because you can't even drive to some of them so little cabins you can stop at yeah they've got the like bothies bo- bo- along the way that you can yeah. that people because there's a lot of hikers do it uh, not so many runners. There's a, a runner called Anna McNuff who wrote a book um, about about that. Um, I, mean, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, part of me is like, well, where can I go that no one's that no one's done it? And that's why running the Orient was such a great one because we we created it ourselves. So if I can come up with another one that that's a sort of self-set mission to go from A to B, and then I'm not competing against, you know, the fastest time. I'm not. I'm never going to be the guy who does the fastest time. You know, I'm not Scott Turek or something. I'm not going to do 45 days for the Appalachian Trail. And I'm not really interested in that because you don't have the kind of experience that I would want. I, I don't want to run from dawn till dusk every day. You know, I'm going to run uh, eight, ten hours a day, maybe 12 hours a day. But I'm still going to have some time to. I'm going to run at the pace where I can see things and enjoy things and occasionally talk to someone. And occasionally, and manage to have dinner while, uh, you know, it's not the middle of the night. So, mm. you know, it's finding the balance between having an adventure and having an ordeal. <laughs> I don't want an ordeal. There will be times that re- resemble an ordeal in the adventure, whether I want them to happen or not. But I don't want the whole thing to be an ordeal. That's yeah. it, Gavin. Where 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 can people buy your book? Um, they can well. I would say in all good news uh, bookshops, but that's that's a challenge at the moment. You know, distribution is not happening the way it should. But on Amazon, running the running the Orient is on Amazon, available on, on Amazon. Or, or sorry, let me just say, you can probably get it from your local independent bookshop on their website. So that yeah. might be the better way to do it. If you know someone who runs a small bookshop, try and buy it from them. Yeah, for friends listening, you can just go into any bookshop and ask them to order in any any yeah. book, book. Not a lot of people know that, and they'll do that. And a, lot of the, um, a lot of the independent bookshops are doing um, delivery services now, mm. so it's a lovely thing if you can write to them, give them whatever titles you want. Um, if you've got the publisher name, then that's 
helpful that they'll find it and they'll send yeah. it to you and if anyone watching the podcast wants a signed copy um then maybe uh they can drop us a line and i can arrange that i can get i can get some book plates from the publisher so where yeah. um where can people find you social media wise uh well on twitter i'm um at gavin underscore boiter and i think instagram is called um right right to run is me um and then i have my i have a website gavinboiter.com which just covers all my creative work brilliant that's the main ways guys thank you so much for joining us it's i feel exhausted just listening to you <laughs> yeah it's always lovely once again, good, thank you for your support. Good luck on the 200 miles. I mean, that's going to be an amazing experience. Yeah, well, we're just going to get in there and get it done. That's, you know, I, I don't have any game plan except to take it steady. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if was it that old Chinese man said, a journey of, of 200 miles is best undertaken in a camper van or something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we could land your rock so you can just drive around and around. <laughs> well, when the, when the, when the, uh, during the night hours when the camera's off, I'll just jump on jump on my bike. <laughs> yeah. no. If we see you on a Segway, we're going to know that something's wrong. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> Guys, massive, massive thank yeah. you. Please look after yourself. Thank you so much for, for your story. To everybody at home, massive love to you all. Thank you for watching another episode of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. <laughs> buy Gavin's book. Yeah. You could buy mine as well. Look at that. That. Yeah, I've that, got a copy. I need to get it to sign it. Yeah, time. that will make a great pre double present. And um, please like and subscribe. See you all soon. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.